Many of you, of course, know him from his 12-year standout career as a professional baller with the Phoenix Suns. Three-time NBA All-Star, I might add. Uh, he founded the Kevin Johnson Corporation, which specializes in real estate development and management, sports management, and business acquisition. Uh, he also founded the St. Hope Academy, a nonprofit community development corporation whose mission is to revitalize communities through public education, civic leadership, economic development, and the arts, and through St. Hope. As many of you know, he formed St. Hope Public Schools, uh, pre-K through 12 independent charter system uh, that provides education now to nearly 2,000 students. And in his spare time, in November of 2008, he became the 55th mayor of Sacramento. Uh, he's the first native of Sacramento to be mayor. He's the first African American to be mayor in Sacramento. And I think that deserves a round of applause. His vision for this city is to be a city that works for everyone. And I think that that uh, is an admirable goal. I think also and, and poignantly, he is a recipient of the John R. Wooden Lifetime Achievement Award. And I think on this day, that award uh, speaks volumes um, as we now understand uh, fully um, the marvelous life that Coach Wooden led. And so, Kevin, it's a really an honor for you, I think, to be a Wooden uh, Achievement Award winner. And, of course, equally as important, he's been a senior fellow at the School of Public Affairs. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. Wooden Award, Public Affairs? Come on. But we're absolutely thrilled to have him here today, Mayor Kevin Johnson. All right, how we doing? I want to say thank you very much for having me to here today. It's an honor for a lot of reasons. I have a mixed and bitter relationship with Southern California, so let me, <laughs> let me get this out of the way first. You know, I grew up in Sacramento, and we were never really taken serious if you're from L.A., so that's when it began. And Then I went to Cal Berkeley because I wasn't recruited by UCLA <clears throat> for basketball, and then UCLA went on to beat us almost every single time we played them, so I had mixed... Don't be clapping at that. <laughs> so I had mixed emotions. <clears throat> then I went on and to have a, <clears throat> a decent career for the Phoenix Suns. And then the, <laughs> then the playoffs came around. And <laughs> to get to the finals, we had to go through the L.A. Lakers. <laughs> and some things have not changed. Phoenix ran into L.A. again this year. And... We are now on the beach in some other city because of the Lakers. I am rooting for the Lakers this year, by the way. And then lastly, I finally thought I would no longer have to be a glutton for punishment when it came to L.A. I got invited to be the commencement speaker here. So, Dean, thank you very much for inviting me until I found out it was Al Gore you really wanted. <laughs> And he couldn't make it, so I am here in Al Gore's place today. <laughs> He's saying, like, how do you find that out? <laughs> I want to thank uh, Chancellor uh, Block for the tremendous opportunity. Um, certainly Dean Gilliam, Associate Dean Fernando Torres Gill, thank you. Um, these are people that I've known for, for quite some time. I've been lucky enough to speak at this public policy uh, school here on, on a few occasions. And then I want to thank VC. Where's VC at? VC, give her a round of applause. I want to thank VC for all that she's done as well. 
All right, so into my remarks. Um, again, impressive students. Listen to all the students speak. Very impressive. Congratulations um, to each and every one of you here today. And as I look out and I see parents and family members and friends, uh, congratulations to all of you as well, because these students would not be here if it was not um, for your commitment, support, and unrelenting belief that they would be successful. So students, let's give our parents and family members a round of applause. So what I'd like to do is, I was lucky enough to play in the NBA, public service, politics, all those things. I tried to pull out what I thought would be uh, the three, as, three biggest lessons that might be helpful to you today as you journey on to the next phase of your life. And uh, certainly when I think about social welfare, urban planning, and public policy, we speak the same language. Um, what you are doing and what you decided to do with your life is so purposeful already. And I am one to say that it's going to get better. Um, the real challenges and successes that you've had to this date will pale in comparison because of the profession and the craft that you chose going forward. So trust me, it will only get better. So again, congratulations once again to all the graduates today. So the first lesson I'd like to share is don't sit on the sidelines. Don't sit on the sidelines. People always ask me, Kevin, how did you go from basketball to, the, to, to become a political elected official and a mayor of the city of Sacramento? Don't sit on the sidelines. It came from growing up. I was raised a single parent mom. Dad drowned when I was three. And my grandfather, without missing a beat, stepped in. He didn't sit on the sidelines, he stepped in. And he raised me with this kind of perspective. He was a sheet metal worker, part of Local 162. Every single day, he got up at 5.45, brushed his teeth, went to the bathroom, was out the house at 6.30, worked his tail off, came back home, 4.45 every single day, walked in the back door, kissed my grandmother three times, had a gin and tonic, set, whoops, sorry, um, get that phone. had a Gatorade, and <laughs> sat down, watched the evening news, had dinner, and went to bed relatively early and did the same thing every day. And you're talking about consistency and structure, and that's what I saw. But here's where the impact was. As a kid five years old, we had some property about an hour and a half outside of Sacramento. And we would go there on the weekends if we were lucky enough. And I remember coming home, it did not ever make a difference. My grandfather would do this every single time. If there was a car that ran out of gas, we would be the ones pulling over. If there was a car that had a flat tire, we would be the ones pulling over. So four years old, five years old, I'm getting a little smarter. And you know, as a kid, that's the last thing you want to do is make a couple stops for people you don't even know. <laughs> so we're coming home this one day, and I can see up a quarter of a mile, this car on the side of the road. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> So I said, hey, Grant. And I pointed to the other side of the freeway. And, <laughs> said, hey, you see those, those telephone wires and those trees? What kind of birds are those? <laughs> and he's looking up at them, and I'm like, yes. And he's like, I think it's a blue jay. What, what is? And he's swerving. <laughs> and he swerved over. Now, that was a good skill later on, I realized, because he had great peripheral vision. <laughs> so as a basketball player, that benefited me as a point guard. <laughs> but as a, as a five-year-old kid, seeing my grandfather Every single time somebody needed assistance, he was going to do it. Second point with my grandfather, don't sit on the sidelines. I'm about eight years old now, and it's on Christmas Eve. I go to bed about 10 o'clock at night at the latest. My grandfather went to bed usually at 8, 8.30, as I said earlier. He woke me up on this one evening, 11 o'clock at night. I said, get in the car. We get in the car, and we drove, which seemed like forever, but we drove um, about 10 minutes. And, you know, when you're little, the world is so big. And he handed me 
Now, again, I'm 44, so if you subtract eight years, you know, that's 36 years ago. So 20, a, 20, a $20 bill was like a, was like a $200 bill, <laughs> especially when you grew up in a poor neighborhood. And he handed me a $20 bill, and we drew, drove to the projects. And he said, he pulled up, and he stopped. He said, I want you to knock on 2C and give them the $20 when they open the door. So I'm, again, half asleep. I'm looking at him. He gives me the, $200, the $20 bill, which felt like a $200 bill. I go knock on 2C. A lady looks down. I look up. I hand her the $200 bill. She starts crying. I run in the car. I look at my grandfather like he was crazy. Puts it in reverse, drives home, tells me to get back in bed. Didn't tell me why. Didn't tell. First of all, I thought he was crazy giving away money. We lived in a poor neighborhood. I'm thinking, like, we need these. <laughs> a couple years later, sitting at the dinner table, I don't know what brought to mind, but I thought about that story, and I asked my grandmother, I said, do you remember a couple years ago when Grant woke me up at 11 o'clock at night and we went to some stranger's house and gave him a $200 bill that we didn't even know? And she said, yes. I said, why did we do that? She said, a day before, that lady was a single parent, had five kids, lived in a decent house, and on Christmas Eve, she's no longer the same person. She's still a single parent with five kids, but all the presents that she had had been stolen and her house had been robbed. And back then, the TV news can tell you where somebody lives. You can't do that today. But it could tell you where somebody lived. So my grandmother actually woke my grandfather up, told him what the story, what had happened. He woke me up, and we did it. The point I want to make here is he never said a word. It's not what you say. It's what you do. And it speaks louder than anything that we can ever say. So why did I get into politics? I was lucky enough to play in the NBA for 12 years, and I moved back to Sacramento. And I said, I want to live in a really cool city, like LA. I hate to admit it, it's a relatively cool city. And I looked at Sacramento, and I didn't think we would get there. I looked at the elected officials, and I looked at the, uh, the politicians who were there and the leadership, and I said, I don't know if we're going to get there. And I thought about my grandfather saying, don't sit on the sidelines. If you feel you can make a difference, if you feel things aren't the way you want them to be, then you need to throw your hat in the ring. And that's what I did, and that's why I ran for mayor. So my first point, as I look down to at all you young people, no matter what you decide to do in your life, don't sit on the sidelines. You've got to get involved. You've got to participate. You've got to get engaged. And by doing that, you will make an impact. My grandfather's commitment to me was, I will make a difference in one person's life. And then my responsibility was to make a difference in more than one per person's life. And now I'm proud to say I'm a mayor of a city that has 500,000 people in it. And more than half of them voted for me, which is pretty cool. So. So in thinking about my grandfather and listening to what you guys have learned, it has been about theory. A lot of it has been about the cognitive, analytical, the one guy got the MPP, the PP, the AR, the, all those acronyms that the doctor, what was his name? Eric. Eric. Holy moly. Where's Eric at? On a side note, Eric, it's a tough economy. If you're looking for work, come to Sacramento. We'll, okay. <laughs> so this, this brings me to my second point. And it, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. That what you learned here is great. You developed your, your thinking, your philosophy. You already had your ethos. So lesson two is stick to your convictions but abandon your assumptions. Hmm. Stick to your convictions and abandon your assumptions. When I was in the NBA, I used to travel from city to city. 
Though some of my teammates despised it, they always were holed up in hotel rooms, and I loved it. I loved getting out. Again, I grew up in a poor community, so I loved traveling for free. <laughs> and it gave me an opportunity to look at what it was necessary to build great cities and what great schools look like in other places and meet some really interesting people. So I'm a Democrat. And, <laughs> and in 1992-93, we were, we were playing the Boston Celtics. And I... <laughs> we were playing the Toronto Raptors. <laughs> We were playing the Boston Celtics, and I said, a cool person to meet in Boston would be Ted Kennedy, Senator Ted Kennedy. I'm a Democrat. He's a Democrat. You don't get any more Democratic than Ted Kennedy. So I call him up, and he said, of course I want to meet with KJ, the point guard for the Phoenix Suns. I'm like, this gig is cool. So on this day, we fly. There she is. So on this day, I'm meeting with Senator Ted Kennedy, and we're talking, and he's telling me about the, the lore of the Kennedys and his mom, Rose, and I'm just thinking, like, I'm, I'm talking to a Kennedy, and he's telling me all these things, and I'm just so excited, and he's talking about his brothers and the president, and finally I say at the end, I say, hey, um, Senator Kennedy, what is your thoughts on charter schools? Because public schools aren't working in our country. Uh, the majority of our kids are not getting a high-quality education. So how are we going to fix them? And what do you think about charter schools? And he looked at me a little puzzled and said, I really don't know a whole lot about charter schools, and I don't know how we're going to fix the public schools. Now, my expectation probably was way too high. <laughs> but this is one of the senior-ranking senators and part of the education committee, and if he didn't know how we were going to fix the public schools, who did know how? And I remember leaving like discombobulated, like disheartened, thinking like, is it just going to continue to be the same? The irony of this, that same NBA season, we're in Washington playing, I can't remember at the time whether it was the Washington Bullets or the Washington Wizards, Anyway, playing the Washington, they weren't very good, whoever they were. <laughs> so we're playing the Washington basketball team. And it's about a year or two later, or, or later that year. And I said, I wonder if Justice Clarence Thomas would meet with me. Now, before you make comments here, let me just say a couple things really quickly. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> And Ted Kennedy is a Democrat. You can't get as far left as Ted Kennedy and as far right as Clarence Thomas. So I'm going there thinking, I have nothing in common with this man but the color of my skin. It's the honest truth. I have nothing in common. So I walk in, and he's friendly, good, firm handshake, and he's got books everywhere. I'm like, whoa, it's like a library. He's like, oh, judge, you're supposed to have books. <laughs> And then on his wall, he had pictures of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. I'm like, I don't know why I didn't expect him quite to. Anyway, that's a <laughs> Then on another wall, he had Winston Churchill. And I'm thinking, there's something about this, this guy that's. He had one book on his desk, one book, the Bible. So anyway, he and I sit down, and we talk for about an hour, and then I finally ask him the question. I say, hey, uh, Justice Thomas, what do you think about charter schools, and how are we going to fix our schools? He said, I don't know a whole lot about charter schools, but I will tell you this. As a single parent, if I was a single parent mom, and if I was trapped in a poor neighborhood, and the only schools that my daughter could go to were public schools that weren't serving them, I would do everything I could to make sure my daughter could go to a charter school or a private school or any school to make sure that she had a chance to experience the American dream. Now, you can see where this is going. 
As I leave there, I'm thinking, that's not what I expected. So my second lesson to you young people is stick to your convictions and abandon your assumptions because you got to be open-minded. You never know where you're going to get the answer you're looking for. You never know. And we as elected officials do no one any justice if we do everything along party lines. I'm a Democrat and all the good ideas are going to come from a Democrat. Or I'm a Republican, all the good ideas are going to come from the Republican side. That's not the case. You have to make sure that you transcend and you get above partisan politics. Because if you don't do that, you're not doing any of us the service that we are warranted, in my opinion. So my second lesson is... Stick to your convictions, but abandon your assumptions. And the best ideas will work for constituents when you implement them. And this gets me to my third point. You know, when I retired from the NBA in 2000, I moved back to Sacramento. And I was very interested in public education and making sure that all kids, especially in underserved communities, had access to high-quality schools. So I moved back to Sacramento and started charter schools. So my third, my third lesson um, is this. Dogs don't bark at parked cars. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Dogs don't bark at parked cars. So I know I'm not trying to get all karate kid and sensei on you. But, <laughs> but think about this for a moment. If you grew up in an underserved community, you would see cars driving down the street and dogs chasing them and barking all the time. Maybe you guys haven't seen that, but trust me, it happens. <laughs> so when I moved back to Sacramento, we wanted to do charter schools. I sat down with the superintendent of schools and said, hey, I'd love to run a charter school in Sacramento, the neighborhood I'm from. He said, how's it going to benefit my school district? I said, what are your challenges? He said, we as a school district cannot figure out how to serve the African-American community, especially the young boys. We're doing a dismal, we, we're, we're horrendous at what we're doing. So I went to the high school that I graduated from, Sacramento High School, and here's what I saw there. I saw incidents of violence, chaos, and apathy, they were all at an all-time high. On the flip side, student achievement levels, graduation rates, and attendance were at an all-time low. High schools in, in underserved communities are the center of those communities. It's where everyone is supposed to gather and come together. So let me fast forward this, this third point. This superintendent allowed my organization, St. Hope, to take over Sacramento High School as a charter school. We wanted to break down a big comprehensive school into smaller learning communities. So let's say there's 1,500 uh, kids at the school. We did three smaller schools at 500 students. Each of them had a principal. And each of them had personalization. Each of them had teachers with longer hours and longer school days. All those things that you know work. So I went and talked to the faculty, kind of like I'm doing today, the teachers that were there. And I, I explained what I just shared with you. I got a standing ovation from the teachers. They said, thanks for coming home. Thanks for restoring the faith and hope in educators. Thank you so much. I come back a week later. I get jeered, jeered all these jeers and cat calls. I think, what in the heck happened in a week's time? The teachers union started telling the teachers, your jobs are unsafe, the work conditions will change, you won't be rewarded properly, all these things that you can imagine. So what happened here is the status quo was being protected. Now this particular school was about to be taken over by the state of California because it was underperforming. One data point, only 20% of seniors we're going on and getting accepted to a four-year college before we took over. 
Everybody okay with that? 20%. The teachers union sued the school district, spent $750,000 to prevent us from taking over a failing school. Thank goodness we prevailed. We won because a law firm stepped up and gave us pro, -mo pro bono legal services to fight the teachers union battle. Now again, I'm pro-teacher. Let me just be clear about that. But the teachers union was not speaking on behalf of all the teachers. They just had that platform to be able to do so. This particular high school today, this particular high school today is one of the top performing high schools in the state of California. This high school currently has the top 10% of schools in the country with a similar demographic. When we first took over, only 20% of seniors were getting accepted. Last year's class, over 80% of seniors got accepted to a four-year college. <laughs> same neighborhood, same demographic, different expectations. Different expectations. So what I want to say to you on this point here is that there's going to be a strong force out there trying to preserve the status quo. And you folks are going to have to fight that. They're going to do everything they can to maintain things and say they're perfect just the way they are. People may like the idea of change, but what change actually occurs, it's when you get the blowback. And that's just real. So don't be deterred. Don't settle for business as usual. Change is hard. And remember, dogs don't bark at parked cars. So if you're not hearing any screaming, any loud noises, or any barking, you're probably not doing anything. You're probably not moving. So we got to remember that. So three lessons for today. You ready? Don't sit on the sidelines. Stick to your convictions, but abandon your assumptions. And thirdly, dogs do not bark at parked cars. You guys got that? Yep. So as I sit down, like all of us up here, we've all had commencement speakers, and about a year or two after, we don't remember anything they've said. And I know I'm not going to be any different. But Alicia repeated them today. So the three lessons I've just shared, but here's your words to live by. And I do believe you're going to remember these words. In fact, I know you will. Because I would be remiss if I didn't talk about John Wooden. We all in here are inextricably linked to history right now. Because a week ago to the day, we lost John Wynn. A week ago today, the greatest coach all time, the Wizard of Westwood from UCLA, the greatest coach in any sport was a UCLA Bruin. And we lost him a week ago today. So thinking about how I would close out, I need to tell you what he would want to tell you. And I know you're going to remember that. John Wynn, I am proud to say, was a friend of mine, somebody I got to know very well over the years. I was one of these people. I did not get recruited by UCLA, which I told you that earlier. <laughs> so I wanted to meet John Wooden, so I crashed the party. <laughs> I called Coach Wooden up, and this is the honest truth. His phone, phone number was never unlisted. Called John Wooden up, told him who I was, said, next time you're in L L.A., come and meet me. Neither, shouldn't have said that, because the next five times I went to L.A., I went and met him. So I met with Coach Wooden very, on, on many of occasions. This man is truly the greatest person that I've ever met. Truly. He's a person that makes you want to be better. He makes you want to be a little bit better than you were before that exchange with him. Man was married to his light wife, Nail, the only person he ever kissed. I mean, come on now. <laughs> I mean, she passed away on the 21st day of a month. 
And for the next 20 years, every month on the 21st, he wrote her a love letter. I mean, think about that. Greatest man I ever met. I'm in Sacramento, and we have a fundraising dinner for my nonprofit as we're taking on Sacramento High School. And <laughs> he was my first choice, by the way. <laughs> uh, I, I called Coach Wooden. He picked up the phone, 8 o'clock at night, picked up the phone. I said, Coach, this is Kevin Johnson. I know who it is. I said, Coach, I got a request. He said, what is it, Kevin? I said, is there any way next month that you could come to Sacramento and speak at our fundraising dinner? Pause here really quickly. Normally, when you ask somebody to speak, your people have to call their people, and then their people may get back to you. And then if they do get back to you, they're going to tell you to call one of their other people. Then you're going to end up with the general counsel. And then you have to fill out a form. Then you talk about the honorarium. And then, then you're actually talking about speaking the next year because so much time went by. You with me? This is what happens for real. So Coach Wooden, 8 o'clock at night, Coach, can you speak next month? So I have, I have two requests. That meant he was about to say yes if I could meet these two requests. I was like, because I could hear him like thumbing through his calendar. He, I said, what are the two requests? He said, number one, you have, I'm 91 or 92 years old at this time. He said, number one, I can't walk through airports because my hips and my knees are gone. So if you can fly me, if you can get a plane that flies me up to Sacramento and back, and my son, who's 65 years old, <laughs> and my son, I'm willing to do it. I'm like, absolutely. I said, what's your second request? He said, my second request is, when I'm speaking, can you put a chair out in front of the podium so I can sit in it because I can't stand very long because I'm 91 years old. You guys good on that? Right. I'm like, I'm not going to say what I really, I cursed because I was so excited, but I said, man, you'll have a, uh, a, a plane pick you up and you'll have a really cool chair with velvet <laughs> out in the front. <laughs> Coach Wooden comes to Sacramento. You know the story I just told you about Sac High and what we did. So one of the students spoke just like you. Coach Wooden, it's his turn to come up and speak. He comes up, he says, I was so moved I was so moved by the students and their stories, I'm going to stand for this one. I don't need my chair. So I'm sitting there like water in my eyes, and he hadn't even said anything yet. <laughs> okay, let me close it for you so you can finish and graduate and tassel and throw up and go hug family and take pictures and go eat and then not remember what happened after that. <laughs> The social welfare group here claps a lot when we talk about that. So my last time I'm in L.A. talking to John Wooden, um, this man's mind is as sharp as a tack, really sharp. And he's quoting a, po a poem by Henry, Henry Longfellow, and not like a, just a little know thyself poem, you know, like where it's all these stanzas. And about after like seriously, like four or five stanzas, he forgets where he's at. And I'm looking at him like, I can't help you finish this book. <laughs> and, he's, and then you feel like, should you change the subject? Like, I mean, like, do I point and ask, you know, like, who wrote that book? He said, no, no, just keep talking. So we talk, and about four or five minutes later, he remembers right where he's at and finishes it. I was like, it's time to leave. I said, coach, thank you for this time. I just have a last request. He said, what is it, Kevin? Anything you need? I said, give me words to live by. I said, I'm not leaving here till you give me some words to live by. He said, Kevin, I can't do that. This is too hard. Look at all these books and all these people who said great things. Coach, I know you're stubborn, but so am I. I'm not leaving till you give me words to look by. And he's looking around. He's thinking. And for the first time, I had him, like, stumped. I had my pen out, too, and my notepad. I was ready to write really quickly and. He said, okay, I got it. You guys ready for this? So here's the words 
to live by that John Wooden gave me. He said, if you really want to do something significant, if you really want to do all the things that you're talking about doing, here's all you need to know. (laughs) A week ago today, he passed away. I was at home, 740, when I first found out. I called his phone number. And his voicemail. I wanted to just hear his voice. Hello, you have reached Coach Wooden. Please leave your number, but speak slowly and distinctly as you leave your message. I'm going to say this slowly and distinctly. We ready? It's like, Kevin, all you need to know for everything you want to do are these two words. Help others. God bless you.